Um, so let us introduce ourselves for those of you who don't know us. Um, I'm, oh, hi, Victor. Um, <laughs> seeing, I'm seeing people in the chat that I haven't seen for a while. Um, I am Sally Potter, and I am the um, current OER faculty coordinator. I am a faculty member in the Humanities Division. Um, I'm the um, current department chair of the EMLS Linguistics Department, and I also teach um, English 1A um, occasionally. And then um, uh, with me is um, Linda Kobashigawa. She is our um, OER librarian. And she also serves our campus as the um, ASCCC um, OERI liaison. And um, uh, a little while later, we're going to have um, one of our um, faculty members from the um, CIT department, um, Computer Information Technology, right? Um, Dennis Moll is um, over here, and he's going to um, uh, present about his. Um, uh, project, um, his grant project um, for um, a few minutes um, when we um, talk about that. So um, we're real excited to have him. So um, what um, we do have um, a lot of people on Zoom and Linda, um, and while I'm talking, Linda is um, going to be watching the chat on Zoom. So if you have a question, um, you can put your question in the chat. Yes, and um, Landon, our student ambassador, is also going to be keeping an eye on it. Oh, okay. cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. Okay. Hi, Landon. Nice. I didn't. <laughs> Thank you, Landon. Nice to nice to meet you. Um, so if you have a question, you can go ahead and put it in the in the chat and um, uh, Linda can interrupt me um, if it's relevant or she can um, answer uh, the question in the chat while she's talking. Um, I'll do the same. Um, and then uh, for those of you who are here in person, go ahead and just, uh, you know, uh, raise your hand or, uh, you know, interrupt um, as we're going. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I did um, I did buy a new clicker um, over um, a new Christmas present for myself, but I um, left it in my office. I know I had it already. I had it. it's a it's a rechargeable one because my old one um, well, it died, but I, I got sick of running out of batteries. Um, but yeah, I just um, so we got to stand and so yes, so yeah, I just <laughs> like to like walk around, but um, yeah, I left it in, in my office. So too bad. Um, yeah, so this is what happens. Okay, so um, I'm gonna... okay, so here's what we plan to do today. Hopefully we'll have time. Um, I think we're gonna have time for all of this. Um, we're gonna talk about and define um, OER and ZTC, a couple of different acronyms that we talk about, discuss why they're important for our students, um, and for us, I'm um, not going to spend too much time on this because we figure that you're here, um, you're, you already like OER, um, you already kind of know what they are and why they're important, so we, we don't want to preach too much to the choir, but, you know, we really um, are believers in this, and so we like to talk about it, and, um, you know, so just indulge us Um please, um, for a few minutes at least. Um, we do want to give um, an update on the different um, grant funding. It is a little bit complicated, but we want to be real transparent with everyone, really get the message out there um, about the different um, sources of funding that we have and um, opportunities that are possibly coming in the future. We don't know for sure, but we're going to give our predictions about um, what could be coming um, maybe next year or in a, a two or three semesters. And then um, we want to, um, of course, talk about some of the work that our faculty are doing right now. Um, Dennis is going to show what he's doing. We're going to talk a little bit about what some of our other um, faculty are doing. And um, I didn't uh, scan too much of the participants in the um, that are on Zoom. So there's possibly some other people um, who are involved in, um, in, in some of the grants that are joining us on Zoom. Maybe they can chime in um, and maybe take a look and see who's here. Um, and then um, at the end, we're gonna talk about um, 
um, how you can um, start looking for um, OER or ZTC materials for your courses. Um, if that's something that you haven't done or if you have already, um, maybe looking for some more things. And we're going to give you some ideas about that and some resources for doing that. Okay, so. Um, okay, so first of all, what are. Um, what are open educational resources? So here's um, a definition from the Hewlett Foundation. Um, OER are teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the, either in the public domain or release under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by um, others. And uh, basically um, what that means is that they have a special um, copyright law. Um, and so I'm going to let, uh, yeah, let Linda um, go ahead and talk about uh, Creative Commons. Okay, it's her area. Just real quick. Um, how many how many of you are identified as being pretty new to OER? You're not super familiar with it. You know, kind of know what it is, maybe. So show hands in the chat. Okay, okay. So I see kind of a, a mix. Some people know quite a bit about OER and some are, are pretty new to it. Um, I went to um, a Creative Commons boot camp the last, the week after the semester ended. So I learned a lot about the commons. I won't talk about them now because they can get really complicated, but I just want you all to know if you do have questions um, about Creative Commons, um, remixing materials, creating collections with open educational resources, feel free to contact me. I'm available to just answer questions, especially if you have a specific use um, that you want to know is is this fair use? Should I be doing this? Can I incorporate this in my OER? Feel free to contact me. Um, like that's all fresh in my knowledge base at this point. So um, I'm excited to help. Um, but uh, basically as Sally was saying, um, Creative Commons is a nonprofit that's dedicated to building a globally accessible public commons of knowledge and culture. And basically um, the prime, one of the primary things that Creative Commons did um, was provide these licenses, these open licenses. Um, these licenses work within existing copyright law. They are not exceptions. They work within the law itself. And basically they just make reusing, redistributing, revising and retaining copyrighted works, something that involves a lot less guesswork, right? So whenever we create something, we put it into a tangible form, it's automatically copyrighted. But that doesn't necessarily tell any potential users how they can use it, what they can use it for, or what they cannot use it for. Creative Commons provides us um, that ability. It makes it a lot more transparent. So pretty much the licenses allow copyright holders to communicate what can and cannot be done with their works. Um, so I'll give you um, a few of the licenses. Again, we're not going to spend too much time on this. If you do have questions about it, again, feel free to reach out to me because this is a ton of information that's packed into a couple of minutes. Um, so this, uh, this diagram illustrates those licenses that are um, uh, more open to not quite OER. Um, I'm going to run through all the licenses and what they actually mean. You, in, in searching for OER, you may have ran across um, uh, resources that had some of these licenses attached. And it's kind of like, okay, I kind of know what that means, but what exactly can I do with it? Um, the most open uh, license is not quite public domain. Public domain is just anything that you can use. It doesn't, it's copyright has expired. It doesn't have a copyright on it. So it's free to use however you want. It's not a license. It's just sort of a designation. And you can put that on there. Um, you can pretty much do whatever you want with something that's in the public domain. I know a lot of things, Mickey Mouse, Steamboat Willie just went <laughs> yeah, into the public yeah, domain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do whatever you want with him. Um, uh, the CC BY is the most open uh, Creative Commons license. That just means you can use that work however you want. You just have to attribute it to the copyright owner. That's that's it. You can sell materials. You can you can do all of those things. Um, CC BY, share alike, same thing, do whatever you want with it. You just need to provide that attribution and share it with that same license. So I'm sorry. So with the, the buy, you could make money off of it, but you don't have to pay royalties to the person who created it. Right. Yeah. 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 That's on, on the buy or the buy and then the same? Uh, both of them. Oh. Actually, yeah, yeah. Um, the next one, buy NC. NC is non-commercial. So those you cannot make money off of. 
Um, but you can still do whatever you want with it. You can remix it. You can change it. You can translate it. You could do whatever you want with it. You just cannot make money off. Okay. Um, and then uh, by NCSA, pretty much the uh, second and third combined, um, you can do whatever you want with it, but you cannot make money off of it. And you have to share it with that same license. Okay. Um, and then these other two, these are a little tricky, but because our definition of open educational resources includes the ability to revise something, to adapt it, to remix it, we don't consider these two that have this ND non-derivative um, to be OER because you cannot make changes to it. That's what ND stands for. You can use it. You can, you can pull an essay that has an ND, put it in your class as is, print out copies of it, give it to all your students. You just cannot make edits to it at all. That's the only difference. Um, uh, so, so those are the licenses in a real quick overview. Do you have anything you want to add to it? No, the the only thing um, maybe that is maybe uh, kind of um, specific to us, it has to do with the uh, non-commercial, the NC, that uh, dollar sign. Um, so um, at Fresno City College, we have um, a bookstore that um, is a commercial bookstore and um, they um, will not usually make copies of things that are that that are uh, um, CC NC anything that CC NC um, because they um, will um, they work with a third party. Um, uh, I don't know, printer. printer or something. And so, so they automatically are going to charge students some ec an extra fee. Um, however, we um, in the, are unique in, the, in our district that we have a production center. We have a copy center. And so we can um, send anything out to have free copies made for our students. So any OER we can make copies of for free, unlimited um, number of them. Um, there, we can only copy in black and white though. Um, so if that's something that's important to you to have color copies, that's kind of a problem, um, but it's totally free, unlimited. You can make as many copies as you want. So that's something you just kind of keep in mind. Um, and I'm happy to talk, yeah, it's a little bit complicated, um, but I'm happy to talk to you about your specific uh, materials in your specific course, um, you know, the details about that a little later. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So getting back to this. So um, uh, I, so besides OER, um, the OER is, Listed over here, these are all the things that we can do with the open resources. Um, Linda kind of mentioned these really quickly. We can remix them. That means kind of like editing them and revising them. We can mix them around. We can reuse them. Once we have them, we can retain them. That means that we can keep them. We can redistribute them. We can give them out. Um, we can have, we can, um, and they're no cost um, except for the paper and the ink. Um, and that means that they're open. Okay, so OER has is talking about the um, license that refers to license. Um, ZTC is an acronym that stands for zero textbook cost. So you may have seen or heard about um, in self service. There is. Um, a little, uh, what do you call it, uh, icon, icon that appears next to some courses in self-service. Um, and um, uh, there's actually two, one's a low cost icon. If, you're, if your course is less than $40, you'll have the low cost icon. It's like a little down arrow. And if your course is free, you have to mark it if it's free. Um, and this, it's a ZTC, um, icon. Um, ZTC refers to not the license, it refers to the cost only. Okay, so 
this is kind of, um, uh, there are different ways to get to zero cost besides being openly licensed, okay? Um, now, fair use, they use this little magician guy over here to show fair use. Fair use is kind of like this, uh, you know, I hear instructors saying, well, I can use like the first like five pages of my textbook or this, this novel. I can use one chapter of this novel and it's considered fair use. Um, if you want to be legal, if you want to do things right, it's very difficult to uh, claim fair use. Okay, so I would just say don't even try it if you want to be legal. It's very, very different. Um, the reason why we are allowed to make copies of the first chapter of a textbook um, before financial aid checks drop is because those students are expected to purchase that textbook. Okay, that's, that's the reason we can legally do it. We are not allowed to make copies of that same textbook if the students are never going, uh, the intention is that they're never going to buy that textbook. Okay, so that's not fair use. There's not a certain percentage or a certain number of pages that's considered fair use. It's just legally, it's just not gonna work. Okay? So yes, last semester, my medical term student said there was a free book online. And, but I don't, I didn't know whether to encourage him to use it or whether it was like legal. Yeah, so like, it's, it's so like, there are lots of free things online that are not legal. So you just have to know that if something is online, if you haven't posted it online, there's a chance that it may disappear, right? The person that posted it may take it down person who posted it, you know, the, they may get caught and it may just, and it may disappear. So you certainly do not want to design right. your course around. You got it on, on a website that sells books, but it was a, it was like a free resource. Right. And I was like, yeah, I mean, you just, I would, um, con contact us. I don't use that anymore. Okay. That yeah. I'm not using that um, anymore. but just, just if you're just curious, you know, like, Hey, what is this? What do you, like, do you think it's, it's, it's legal? Yeah. Probably not. Um, or if, you know, you can always, you can always contact us and we can just double check the say like, yeah, I know I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on that. And yeah, cause we can, we can yeah. help with that. Yeah. 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 Cause those are, those are iffy, very, very iffy. Yeah. Yeah. It happened last semester. It never happened before. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Sometimes they'll pop up. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'll pop yeah, up. you can be chasing around like videos or PDFs of things. They'll be here and then they'll disappear and then they'll be over here. And it's kind of it's it's dangerous to plan your full course around. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. be careful about that. Yeah. Okay. So ZTC. Oh, um, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, Chelsea asks, can we request OER for certain textbooks? There was one specifically that I remember being an option, but it no longer seems to be. Um, what do you mean request? Um, I remember, uh, I think it was last semester, or maybe it was the semester before, there was, um, it was a textbook for medical law and ethics, and um, I'm trying to remember who I contacted. I'm sorry, I think it was Linda... Um, it was it was an option for OER, um, to, so the students didn't have to purchase a textbook. Maybe it was a Biblio. It, oh, it could have been, yeah, Biblio. That's what option. it was. Yes, yes. Um, so, so that's so. This is a good um, segue into zero textbook costs versus OER. So, the materials okay. available in Biblio are not OER. They gotcha. are all okay. rights reserved, uh, published by McGraw Hill Springer. That's where they found. Um, and those can be, those are a little more secure um, because they go through the, uh, the Biblio works with the textbook publishers to ensure that we have a specific um, um, edition and copies and things like that. Um, however, those materials are not openly licensed. There is a limit to them just based on our budget and how, how many 
um, books that are available. Um, but that is definitely an option for students to use the, the book for the full semester. Um, however, they're not OER. Okay. Um, Understood. Right. Thank you. It's a, it's a little bit like a textbook reserve system. If you're familiar with um, how we loan out reserves, uh, physical textbooks on reserve for a limited amount of time, it's how BibliU works um, electronically. Yeah. Okay. So does that make, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Thank so you. transitioning into this other category. Um, so this, this is uh, ZTC, which, um, you know, so, so, so again, this is referring to not the license of the materials, but the cost of the course or the cost of the materials. Um, so, the, and there are some different ways to get to zero. Um, so one of those ways would be to use library resources. So any resources that your students have access to through the library, anything that they can check out, um, you can give them. Now, um, there are, you know, in terms of ebooks, journal articles, um, there are different licenses that the, that our library has purchased. So, and you know, uh, an example of ebooks. There, some some of our ebooks. There's one single license, and one single student can have uh, the book at a time. And then there's another kind of license that is unlimited. So, how do you tell the difference? The way I tell the difference is I ask a librarian and then they figure it out for me and then they give me the information. Okay, that's how I do. Um, so we have many, you know, few librarians. They're very knowledgeable. They figure that out. Um, there are, um, uh, you know, we have lots of newspapers, journal articles. We have um, subscription to the New York Times, um, videos on demand, um, you know, Anything that's behind that paywall, all of that can be uh, uh, built up so that you can make your course. Um, websites, anything that is free on the web, you can use that to build your course. Um, you should be aware of accessibility issues though. So when you're linking out to websites, um, be careful because most websites are not accessible. So what that means is that when a student is using a screen reader, there are ads, pop-up ads, bad you know text. They don't have the um, the styles and the, the alt text on the images. Those are really problematic for students. Um, so um, a good thing to do would be to grab the text and then put it in canvas pages the part that you want you know just be really careful write and then writing your own um uh little blurbs um you can use um ai you use chat gpt to um make your um work easier those kind of things okay um okay i'm gonna speed up a little bit because we're this, this is going Okay, so um, one thing to keep in mind is that students can't learn from books they can't afford. So this is from a 2018 um, survey of university students. So uh, four-year um, college uh, students and university students, 64.25% um, uh, of students that were surveyed surveyed um, didn't purchase a textbook at some point in their college career. 42% uh, uh, of students took fewer courses because they couldn't purchase it, uh, couldn't afford to purchase a textbook. Um, over 40% of them did not register for specific courses. 36% um, of them almost um, earned a poor grade because they couldn't afford a textbook. Um, and almost 23% of them dropped a course because they couldn't afford the textbook. Um, these are similar, maybe the same um, stats that Gata was sharing with us. Uh, what was that yes yesterday? That was yesterday. Um, one thing to keep in mind about this is that, um, you know, some of these are strategies that students will use 
For example, not purchasing the textbook, and probably a lot of you have had this experience when you are requiring a, a textbook or you have an expensive textbook in your course that you'll notice that some students um, don't buy the textbook or they wait um, for a while before they buy the textbook. And they might even lie to you about um, having the, you know, not having the textbook. They might say, oh, yeah, I have it. I forgot it. Um, or they'll, um, they will say, oh, I lost it. Or then they'll come, they'll come with the wrong edition of the textbook, you know, like two editions ago textbook. Um, and then they will take a gamble and they'll think, well, maybe... I can get away with uh, passing this class um, without purchasing the textbook. Um, they probably think that I'm not, I'm probably not going to get an A or maybe a B um, if I don't buy the textbook, but I really can't afford to pay $150 for this, for this class. And it's not my major. Um, I just need to, I just need to pass this class. Um, that is a strategy that a very savvy student would use, a student who is very experienced in college. Um, it's not a strategy that um, typically first-generation students will use, um, students who are first-time college students, students who do not have support systems, those students are going to um, try everything they can to buy the book. They're gonna walk into the bookstore, they're gonna see the cost of the book, and then they're going to feel like, I can't afford this, college isn't for me, turn around, walk out, and not come back. Okay, and that's where we lose students, right? Um, so just, you know, that's just something to think about. Um, and while you're thinking about that, I'm just going to leave these comments up here. The, this is a 2019, um, so right before COVID, this is before COVID, right before COVID, um, there was a state center um, student survey that asked about the cost of textbooks. These are the comments, just open-ended comments. Just what do you think? The question was, what do you think about the cost of textbooks? How does the cost of textbooks affect you? Let me just leave this up here for a second. Okay, and I'm not done yet. One more. Sorry, fall 2017. Okay. Okay, so now the good news. Advantages for us. Okay, so um, really quickly, I'm going to start, I'm going to go faster, I promise. Um, I love creating my own content. I love not being tied to a commercial textbook um, publisher because I know my COR, I know what I have to teach, I know what my students need. Um, I, can, I can design the course content the way that I want to design it. Um, I work with my colleagues to create my two courses and it was fun doing it. Yes, it was a lot of work, but it was fun doing it. Um, we're gonna talk about, uh, at the end, if we have some time, we're gonna talk about uh, backwards mapping and how you can do that 
Um, but yes, it does take some work to get there, but um, I just want you to kind of think about that um, as we talk about this a little bit. Okay, um, the grant funding. Okay, so this is where we start getting into the weeds a little bit here. Um, there's two sources of grant funding right now that we're dealing with, and I made this little this little chart. Um, I'm an English teacher, so I, I'm not, I, no spreadsheets for me. Um, this is how I like to look at it. Okay, uh, charts. Okay, um, so um, there's district funds, and we received this block allocation from the district, almost $200,000. Um, the district made a million dollars available for OER. And so each college could apply for a maximum of $200,000. We were awarded um, $193,490. And um, we um, uh, had a process where instructors could apply for um, uh, award awards under five different categories, and uh, that process was done in the fall. Um, and then we had state funds. Okay, so the um, planning grant and the implementation grant, those kind of went together. Talk about a little bit more, those a little bit more together. Um, and um, the acceleration grant, um, all of these state funds, the key there is that they want colleges to develop zero textbook cost pathways. And the pathways are defined as a full degree, including the GE courses or a CTE certificate of competency, okay? So they have to be zero cost and they have to be a full degree, but it could be GE courses that lead up to that. Um, or a CTE certificate, okay? So if you teach one of those degree pathways or a GE course or CTE certificate, then you can be funded. Um, and then um, the acceleration um, grant, we were awarded uh, $475,000 and and it was really important, um, uh, this non-duplicative uh, degree that is gonna be important, I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. Okay, um, so this is what we had for the district funds, these different categories, da, 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 da. I'm gonna skip over that right now. Um, for the state funds, um, for the planning and implementation grant, um, this is what we're spending the money on, the $200,000 reassigned time for me to coordinate this. Um, the training program for the award participants and equipment for CIT Pathway Project. Um, the state funds, um, this is what we're being paid for from the state. We're getting $200,000 um, for a cybersecurity CTE certificate. Our ed, AS degree, Spanish, ABT, we're getting 25,000, human biology, we're getting 25,000, library tech, uh, 25,000. Now, um, why are we getting 200,000 and 200,000 for these two pathways? Only 25,000 piece for these bottom three. Um, that's because we talk to or consider non duplicative and the bottom three were considered duplicative. So what that means is that the state wanted um, these uh, the degrees to be unique in the state of California. So the top two were deemed um, to be that no other college in the state of California had these two specific degrees, degree and a certificate of competency. And with that, I'm gonna let Dennis talk about these two degrees or pathways, two pathways. Okay, go for it. Thanks so much, Sally. So my name is Dennis Moll. I'm with the, in the computer information technology department. And uh, as Sally mentioned, uh, the two 
grants that we were awarded came out of uh, Sally uh, pretty much pestering me to uh, submit them. And her language to me was special population. Well, I'm in CTE, we have special populations, so I wrote those grants. I am also a computer scientist by education, and I we we do not chat GPT into these grants. So I'm gonna share with you what um, my colleagues and I did. I have two colleagues, um, Rhea Waller and Bernd Farley, they're also in CIT. What we did over uh, um, winter break, over winter break. So um, I was at an interesting, very good uh, workshop in this very room uh, just before this, and everyone was talking about this. And I will ask you, everyone, right? Right. So does, don't answer yet, but does anyone know what the G here means? The P or the T? So, the, the G means generative. What does that mean? Oh, I forgot to wish everyone happy. Okay, that's it. This is what G, the G means. You predicted what my next two words were, right? Happy New Year. How did you do that? Well, because we're, I, and this gets back to, to uh, linguistics, the way our brains work. You know, we know these things, but how did we know? How did you know that the next two words were New Year? Well, you knew it because of relationships. First of all, what time of year it is, everyone's saying this. And anyway, those relationships in, uh, they were mapped with these things called vectors. They were, the relationships between words were mapped by uh, Google in 2013. Here's their paper, 2013, and they're called vectors. So uh, the vectors create relationships between words. The words are paired with these probability matrices, and the probability, probability matrices generate another word. That is all the ChatGPT does. It just predicts and then gives to you, if it's a chatbot, the next word. So just like happy, I could have been happy birthday, right? Could have been, could have been happy, you know, happy hunting for your OER materials. Who knows what it could have been? And there are what, 20,000? I remember doing this when I prepared this talk, but there's thousands and thousands of words I had no idea. And, and, the dictionary, but anyway, ChatGPT just uses 10,000 10, words. So anyway, this is all that ChatGPT does is predict the next word. Uh, the, I promise you what these these would be. Now, so if it generates the next word because uh, uh, the uh, computer scientists have done the math on this and they've created the probability matrices, which look like huge spreadsheets, how do you manage all these huge spreadsheets? Uh, it became unmanageable. Large language models have been around for a long time until more Google people in their uh, free time, seriously in their free time, at Google you get 20% uh, of your work can be on whatever you want. So these people were working on this, how to get rid of these huge uh, We'll look at them as spreadsheet. How to get rid of these huge spreadsheets and determine what the next word would be. It's all just text complete. So they developed a thing called a transformer, right? So this is what a transformer actually looks like. My favorite diagram here, this is a transformer. So it makes these, uh, it gets rid of the um, huge uh, worksheets, if you will, and makes them do this. What is the Here, P? Transformer, like oh, that. The P? Oh, okay, I haven't gotten to the oh, P okay. yet. So the, yep, 
uh, relationships in vectors. And, uh, just, and just to give you a sense of this, uh, you know, my team is, is, is working on this. So the code is in my computer that I'll show you. It's just, it's just computer code. It's Python code and in and, and frameworks, but the relationships chat, uh, OpenAI has, it's called an embedding model. Their embedding model has uh, about 1,500 relationships for a single word. So a single word is, has 1,500 numbers that are relationships. And then you can also have uh, uh, groups of words or paragraphs or even, um, even PDFs can be related. And anyway, that's what the G means. So the T is an easy way of handling the, the next word. And so here comes the P. So the this was this paid the vectors, these cool new vectors were created in 2013, transformers created in 2017. Why did ChatGPT just appear last year? Well, it appeared last year because OpenAI, oh, and by the way, there's really nothing open about OpenAI. It is a commercial enterprise, um, but uh, it's not like our open educational resources, right? Anyway, they pre-trained it. That's what the P means, pre-trained, okay? So generative pre-trained transformer. That's all that this stuff does. So uh, my project was uh, creating a, oh, let me back up. So the charter for my team, the three of us in, we have three years, I think, we, we wanna do this in two years. We want to produce not only a textbook, but we want to produce a chatbot that is the entire course for all of these classes. So imagine that, there's no more textbook, there's no more, uh, uh, it's, the students can uh, get everything uh, with their chatbot on their phone. Now, how do they do that? Well, we're figuring out how, how to do that. My project was to uh, uh, assemble the uh, OER material for my specific Python class. And there was a lot of it. So what I did was I created a chatbot and I need to figure out a way, Linda will give me resources, I think, to, to host this to get it to you, but it's a PDF. So what you do is you select the PDFs and then those PDFs, you, you tell your chatbot to create chapters of those PDFs. So it's not magic. You can just, I, you know, I've tried, you can't just, you know, uh, click on this and say, you know, write a textbook, but it is in increments. So that's my project um, that I did. And again, you all be able to uh, uh, see this soon. And uh, I think it's a good use of the AI technology there. And then, like I say, uh, Rhea Waller is working on prompt engineering. She's working with these new things called uh, Google Notebooks. I don't really know what they are other than hearing her talk about it. She's pretty excited about that. And then Vern Farley is interfacing with Canvas. So she's figuring out how to um, uh, send what a student would do, right? The long term is a student will take their quizzes, you know, on the, the chat bar or, or submit their papers or coursework, whatever. And then it will be somehow reported onto Canvas. So we're trying to figure that out as well. So I have a question. sure. I just found out about this last semester. My my younger students in one of my classes was telling me about it, and they were writing essays. Yes. From that. And yes. I was like, what? Yes. So. Yes. Do, can we consider that cheating? Well, you know that was what. No. We talked about that. You know, it depends. Now there is a thing. It, First of all, it's not cheating. Uh, second of all, Chat TPT, I've, I, I've come to terms with this. It is a better writer than me. It is. It's a better writer and it does not have writer's block. It gets things, gets things done. If I want to start on a project, I'll just give the Chat GPT a prompt and it gives me something. It may not be perfect, but at least I have something started. Now, is it cheating? Uh, you know, it's, it is phenomenal the stuff that I've learned about Chat GPT 
just building these chatbots. Um, I think what we have to do is to uh, make the uh, make the learning process of writing the essays still there so that our students just don't use ChatGPT to create an essay. I mean, there, there is something, there is a utility in that. They have to use the right prompts and everything in that, but I get what you're saying. You want to use that. They need some critical thinking learning yeah. along the way, right? Yeah. Well, not only that, but they need to do their research. And if they, and I know, because I did it one day. I, yeah, yeah, this, this, yeah well, I don't want to get off on this topic because that, we, we did two sessions this morning on that. This is a total, this is going to take us right. into a totally yeah, different. Morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we spent through, yeah, we spent a lot. Yeah, this is a totally different, different topic. So we can, we can spend another five hours on this. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ty. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much. But it, it could be a tool for potentially for OER, you know? If yes. you're undertaking, yes. uh, you know, a huge transformation for your course, updating materials, it's a tool that you can use to be able to do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna hurry. We're gonna hurry it up. Um, so I have a, just a couple of um, FAQs here. Um, you know, who's managing the grants? Uh, that's Donna Cooper is actually in charge. Me, you know. You know, I mean, technically, she, I guess she is, but in reality, I'm the one that's kind of doing it. Um, constituency groups, there's an OER committee. So, is it? Yes. It was, uh, I saw the library, so the dean of library, that's it. So, the dean that's, of library. That's Donna, yeah. Oh, that is. Yeah, Donna. yeah, yeah. So, she, she was the, like her own boss. Now she's the, oh, she was her, she was the dean and her own boss. Now she's back to just being the dean. Got it. Yeah. And God is her boss now, yeah. Um, but she, yeah, so, um, um, and then um, we have an OER committee that is a committee of academic senate, and then there's a ZTC task force that comes out of that committee. The task force is charged with making recommendations about the allocation of the, of the funds, um, and then that goes through uh, the committee, and then that and it goes through academic senate, and then there's also a district um, work group that, is in kind of oversees the district funds. Um, uh, when are faculty paid? Um, after the projects are completed and published and then signed off by the peer reviewers, content reviewers, and um, if applicable, the coordinator. Um, will there be another opportunity for faculty to participate? So we don't know 100% for sure, but um, what we do know is that there still should be money out there. So. Uh, if you do the math, um, there. Uh, remember, I said that there is a million dollars that the district has set aside. Um, we received almost two hundred thousand of that money, and there's four colleges. The other colleges received less than we did. Um, and so there's still going to be some money left. Um, not as much, you know, in the later rounds, but there should still be some district money. Um, if you add up the four hundred and seventy-five thousand um, dollars that we're getting from the state, um, there still should be some money left after um, these folks complete all of their projects. Um, there still will be some state money that has that will that's left to be allocated. So, so we don't know for sure how much, but there should be uh, money for another round, possibly next fall or spring 26, 25, 25, yeah, yeah. Question? Oh, okay. Um, so most, very likely, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. okay. Um, so, uh, if you're interested in starting to look for, for OER, um, we have a few, we have a few, a few um, resources that we think have the best or the most curated collection of materials for you to get started. There's a lot of places that you can look for OER. Um, um, uh, but these, I think, are the best 
places for you to look. Um, of course, you can always contact us and um, and and ask um, uh, specific to your discipline because these might these resources that we've linked to might not all um, cover every single discipline. Some of them again are very curated. Um, the first place that I want to show you, I'm not sure if it's YouTube presentation. That is good. our. Um, the most previous thing that we did for that open ed week thing. Okay. Okay. So just yeah. an overview. That's an overview of OER. And we went through a long list of uh, resources. We also have a handout that we can send everyone that has um, more. more uh, I just I just put all of those links in the chat for everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the first place, I'm going to jump through these real quick because I know we're running a little short on time. Um, the first place that I want to show you is the OERI website. This is, again, through the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. Um, this is a really so great place. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is a really great place to start looking for materials. Um, these materials are highly curated. They've either been created or reviewed um, and even funded by the um, OER initiative through the ASCCC, developed by um, California Community College faculty, reviewed by them as well. So, oh, sorry, sorry, we keep moving. We're good, yeah, yeah. Um, so if you go up to resources where we just linked curated OER collections, and then it's going to list um, in alphabetical order the areas that you can search for. It shows you when they were last updated. Some of them are very recent. Um, and we can also search by um, uh, funded um, projects through the ASCCC. Usually they do a call out for applications um, to be funded to work with other faculty in your area from across the system, and you can work on developing materials for a specific course. Um, you can also contact your discipline lead in the system. So that might be helpful for you, especially if maybe you're the only faculty in your area, um, or um, you're not sure where to start and you'd like a little more information about it. There are faculty leads from various California community colleges um, that you can contact um, on here. And just know these people are paid to do this position, so you're not bugging them. No. Yeah. 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 They they want to help. <laughs> are we going to get some? Yeah. So a couple ways to get it. Susie is sends all of the powerpoints to everyone at some point. There may be a delay on that. Another faster way to get it is email me. Um, if you email me right now, sally.potter, I can send it to you within a couple minutes. Awesome. You're talking about Susie Mitzel, right? Yes. Um, Canvas Commons is another good place to look. Um, I think, I, was it you, Sally, who you likened it to sort of like a thrift store in, yes. <laughs> in a way? So, um, you know, there's, you can find, you know, a few treasures in there. There might be some really good stuff, but there's also probably going to be a lot of not great stuff that you don't want to buy. Um, so just be aware, anyone can put anything on Canvas Commons. Um, so just be aware of that. But there are also really good materials on there, some from the ASCCC OERI that pair with um, a lot of the um, OER that they've shared on there, too, with ancillaries and things like that. I'm not going to click into it because I'm not signed in and I'm going to do the whole multi-factor thing. Um, OK, the other um, the other one is OpenStax. This is one of the more familiar names, if, if you're um, a little bit familiar with OER. Um, OpenStax is being used by quite a few faculty on this campus, I think. Um, it is, they, these are full on textbooks. So there you can access the EPUB version, the PDF version, download it, by, um, and it's a, this is a um, project at Rice University. All of these materials have been peer reviewed um, and they also suggest edits for errata and things like that. So um, uh, there's quite a few general ed um, textbooks in here. Uh, and even some things having to do with college success that you can pick and pull from. I've heard a lot of faculty um, who say they, you know, I want to incorporate something about college success or, you know, how to how to be a successful college student into my course in the first couple of weeks. Um, I know a lot of faculty have used this college success book um, to open do that. Stacks. Open stacks, yes. Um, and again, there are there are quite a few math, science, um, poli sci, sociology, those kinds of. Um, uh, textbooks in here. And OpenStax is really um, 
helpful because let me see if I can find it. So I'm gonna look in college success textbook. When you go to instructor resources, they have cartridges that you can upload into your course. It uh, uploads the modules with all the text, uh, with all the text from the book in there. And there's also some ancillaries that um, you can input like assessments, uh, presentations, things like that. So it comes with a lot of those things. I think a lot of these also um, come with um, pre-made course shells that are already in Canvas as well. So you can pull from those too. Okay, Skills Commons. Skills Commons is helpful for career um, and technology resources. Um, there are a lot of different materials in here. You can, I usually go up to browse, search by um, industry um, or material type and just use the um, the limiters there. So you can use that as well. Um, this is all kinds of things from manufacturing to construction to um, information technology um, and it's various materials. It can be textbooks, but it's also assessments, ancillaries, things like that. So skills common is the only one that I know of that's for career time. Is that really okay. OER Commons is um, a, just a massive repository or repository. Um, you can find quite a few things, limit by education level, which is what I like. So if you just want to focus on community college, maybe take some things from um, upper division and things like that, you can. Um, I would just recommend using your limiters. Um, and this pulls from quite a few uh, different sources. So you may find OpenStax materials in here and BC Commons materials and other things. It pulls from a lot of different um, areas, but I like being able to limit by either the license type or the material type if I'm looking for something really specific. So that's OER Commons. Um, and then we have a local OER LibGuide that I've developed. Um, this is always a work in progress. Um, um, again, this is local to us. I'm trying to make it a little more focused um, and specific for Fresno City College, um, and especially sharing what faculty on this campus are using. So that's something I'm working on um, developing, um, always working on developing, um, especially this semester as we're gearing up to create these DTC degrees. Um, and there are some curated materials in here. I've tried to break it down by uh, subject area and then the different majors within those subject areas. I'm sorry, where is this again? This is a lit guide through, through the FCC library. Um, and I can't, yeah, through the library. Um, again, if you want the link, we'll send them all to you. Um, and feel free to send me suggestions, anything else you'd like to see on this guide. Um, so want to make sure it's as helpful and relevant to um, faculty who are exploring OER and searching for OER um, as possible. Okay, any questions on the, the resources? I was trying to find those lists um, on the ASCCC page for, by you were showing the, the contact people by subject. Yes. Um, um, on the, but I think Okay, so are you on this page? Yeah. So resources, um, I go to curated co collections, and then there is a, um, if you go to OER by discipline, oh, actually, there's a link right here, discipline. Okay. Yeah, that should take you to all of those folks. I'm not surprised, don't have one. <laughs> really? I like nutrition. Nutrition, okay. I met a nutrition instructor at a Creative Commons boot camp, but... I might be able to send for okay. info too. Um, okay, so um, how to start building DTC? Um, I I feel like doing this is pretty much akin to how you would incorporate any new material in your course, even if you're switching from one commercial text to another or one homeworking system to another. Um, it's very it, it's pretty much the same process you would use. Um, to do that. It's just backwards design for learning. I had a couple of examples, but I lost them in this PowerPoint, so I can't link to them. Um, but um, you can, you don't have to start with a full-on replacement of your entire textbook. That's really intimidating, and it is a lot of work. We do have some faculty who do that. They'll do it over the break. 
Um, but I think the way the way I started, I think the way Sally started was just to replace a couple of things. Um, see how it works with your students and then kind of continue on finding additional materials as you know the semester goes on, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, and then of course, uh, mapping your uh, learning outcomes and objectives and um, your, your to your course design and to all of your assessments. So just kind of working backwards and then figuring out what OER is going to, what you're going to be able to plug in um, for each of those units so that your students can um, meet those, those learning outcomes. Um, and I'll make sure that I get some of those, I wonder if I just search for it in here, um, if I can find them and show them to you all. Um, any questions on, I think actually my next slide is questions. So Linda, what I did is I took my medical terminology book and I found one in OER. So I said, oh, we are, but only the textbook, but I'm still doing all my tests and everything the same, like using the same tests and okay. using the same. So that works, right? As I'm really new at this. So. Okay. Um, well, I mean, congratulations. That's awesome. Um, well, we'll see how that happens. <laughs> well, I that, loved the textbook. So yeah, yeah. It is, and it's it's hard because all of your assessments, all of your activities are designed around that content. Yeah, and how we change all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say as long as you're still able to use the content um, to teach them what they need to know to do well on the assessments, then it it works. The, the the biggest thing is with OER, if you decide, I want to update this so that it's more relevant or more current or it's more localized to things that, you know, my students are experiencing, you can do that now. Um, but, yeah, I think I... Well, I think I just basically used the book that they had in the OER. Okay. And some of the homework because it had what, what was really cool is it had like um things where they could move around and and put oh like matching like, kind of matching stuff. and stuff so that was part and it wasn't graded so that because it was in within the lecture book art portion but then i added my own lecture kind of in at the beginning and i didn't want it to be too overwhelming so we're going to see how it does. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's, I mean, you can customize it, right? You, you were able to say, well, I don't really like this or I need well, to supplement a little I bit. I couldn't figure out how to take stuff in to add my stuff because it was already like, it was like a PDF or something. Or like yeah. something you couldn't really edit. Sort of, I couldn't really edit. Yeah. So I just put the book portion in there and then edited my stuff. Oh, I said, okay. Like supplemented it in there. It wouldn't yeah. let me add to it, but I just put it in the same. Yeah, sometimes yeah, sometimes that's what you have to do if they don't make the OER easily editable. Because there there are cases oh, like yeah, there, I a, couldn't even edit it. Yeah. Because it was a book, so yeah. I couldn't really. Yeah, so that's that, some of the issues. That's some of the things that the OER community, I think, is kind of researching is like, how do we make this more accessible for faculty to not only adopt, but to make it their own and really just make it a, a more streamlined process from like finding this book, I like to get to getting it in your class and then making the update. So it really just depends on who created it, what platform they're using, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Do we have anything in the chat? Okay, if there are no other questions, we're there is a question. Oh, there is a question. Okay. Oh, they just popped up all of a sudden. Okay. Um, okay, Kirsty, does anyone have good references for creating your own OER webpage? Oh, that's a great question. For creating your own oh, webpage. Page. I know, I know some people have used, well, LibreText is is what, and do you mean create like your own OER content? Yeah. Um, yeah, LibreText is one. There is a there's a there's a somewhat steep learning curve with LibreText, but it does have its remixer that you can yeah. pull things in. Kirsty. Um Google Sites is another one I've seen used. 
Do you have do you have any other? Um Google sites would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Adobe, we have um what's Adobe's the one it's like all in one page at times two. Yeah. Yeah. We have access to that as well. So I don't uh Kirsty, I don't know if this is necessarily what you're talking about, but um I'm gonna do this with my students this semester, um, something called open pedagogy, which is um, uh, very closely related to OER. This is where you um, you have the students um, build the OER materials. So um, one of the classes that I teach is Linguistics 10, Introduction to Language. Um, and so um, what I'm gonna do is have this, after the first five weeks of this semester, I'm gonna have the students work in groups and choose um, topics. Um, and so they'll be research. So each group will be researching a different topic and then they're going to create, um, we're going to create a website. I'm going to work with Sue Yang on this. So I don't know what, um, platform or what kind of website we're going to use. She's, she's already told me that she knows what it's going to be. Um, I'm hoping that she can come to my class and, and explain it. So I don't have to do, I don't have to do that part. I don't know. Maybe Dennis will come and do that for me. I don't know. Um, uh, but um, this, but basically um, I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach my students about the um, copyright. I'm going to teach them about the, um, the CC licenses. So they know what to look for, what they, what they can and can't do. And then they're going to be the researchers and they're going to look for open licensed materials and um, um, and ZTC materials through our library. And then they're going to build the website and they're going to put information on this website. And the, um, the website is going to have, you know, introductory uh, linguistics ma materials on it. And then um, uh, next semester, um, it will... The, the students for, for next fall will use that as a base and then they will add on to it and it will be a public website. So um, it will be out there in the world. So anyone who, you know, is interested in linguistics or who teaches linguistics can use it. Um, it will be a, um, you know, uh, it's, you know, a living, yeah, a living, a, a real website, you know, they're, um, yeah. yeah. Monday, that was called Adobe Express. Adobe Express. Okay, thank you. Do we have access to that? We should. It needs to be a license, right? We should. Yeah. We should if not. Yeah, we have access to everything Adobe. Is it only on campus or through our. Uh, or do we know? Say anything I get from Adobe, I have to be on campus to, to interact with it. If I try to do it from home, I can't interact. With okay, it. that makes sense. Yeah. So it's just on campus. Uh, is it in the creative suite? Adobe Creative Suite? Should be, yeah. Yeah, it should be. And good question. Yeah. Adobe Creative Suite. Oh yeah, Kirsty says, thank you. That is a wonderful idea to bring in the students. Yeah, I think it's um, what open pedagogy uh, we're not practicing well, we should do a session on um, I, I think someone else on I'm sure a few people are doing it, but um, yeah. the students just, you know, they can put their own voices into like, this content, right? That's being used each semester and and copyrighted. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's kind of common to do that type of thing like within your class where you have students kind of creating like a quiz or like, a, you know, activities for like one group will create it for like other groups in the class, but to but to do it for like outside, you know, like outside the class, that's where it becomes open. That's kind of more little, you know, it's it's higher stakes that way, yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your life.